Welcome back, everybody. Today we are revising and expanding on what you learned last year in grade 10 in talking about types of distribution. So in terms of our data cycle, we're looking at representing graphically. So we're going to return to the box and whisper plot that you know from last year. And then we're also going to focus on interpreting. And now in grade 11, there's a bigger emphasis on interpretation of graphs and interpretation of data. When we talk about skewness, to me, I think if something's skew, it's like if there's a picture on the wall that's off balance, you know, it's, it's crooked. And it's the same thing when we talk about skewness in the data. So skewed data is data that's imbalanced. And this is caused by outliers. What an outlier is, you learned about it in grade nine. An outlier is any extreme value. It could be really high or it could be really low, but it literally lies outside of the normal pattern of the data. So it doesn't fit in with the rest. Okay. Let's say we survey I think it's seven boys in the class, yeah, seven, and ask them how many times they brush their teeth per day. Most of the boys hopefully are gonna say two, maybe three times. Okay, there are a couple ones in there. There's maybe one OCD child who brushes his teeth 10 times a day. Now this is obviously doesn't fit with the rest of the data, so we call this an outlier. And if we were to take the average of this data, or the mean, the mean would be 3. But notice, compared to the rest of the data, there's only one value that's 3. All of the other values are below 3. So this 10 is causing the mean to be higher than most of the rest of the data, and that's creating what we call a skewness in the data. Okay, the outlier is causing the data to be imbalanced. Let's look at another example. If we look at marks on a test, we can see that on this test, now these are already arranged in ascending order, we can see that somebody got a 10 while the rest of the class got sort of in the range of 60, high 60s, low 70s. So this 10 is obviously not fitting with the rest of the group. So we call this an outlier. If we calculated the mean for this class, including the 10, we'd find that the mean score was 61. But we can see that 61 would fall between these two numbers, so it's much lower than the majority of the data. So this 10 is causing the data to be skewed. Let's visualize this in terms of a box and whisker plot. This is the example that we looked at in our last lesson involving the net worth of some major soccer teams. Okay, remember how the box and whisker plot shows us the minimum, the upper and lower quartiles, and the median. And we added in the mean. We found that the mean was $2.32 billion. Okay, and notice how the mean is quite a bit higher than the median is. So that's where we mean the, there's a value here that's pulling the mean higher than where the middle half of the data lies. Okay, so this data is skewed because there's this imbalance here between the mean and the median. And that's how we figure out skewness. We really just look at the mean and the median and we see where the mean is relative to the median. This tells us how the data is distributed or how it falls around these two measures of central tendency. Okay, when the mean is greater than the median, we say it is positively skewed because there's some high value up here that is pulling the mean away from the median in the positive direction. So it's pulling the mean upwards in the positive direction. So there are three types of distributions depending where the mean and the median are. We just spoke about when the mean is greater than the median. 
we call this positively skewed. And another way of saying this that I don't think you've learned yet is we say this is skewed to the right, okay? Meaning there's some value on the right, there's some high value on the right that's pulling in the positive direction, okay? Pulling the mean upwards. We then have the opposite situation where the mean is now less than the median. In this case, there's some low value that's pulling the mean downwards. So we say that this is negatively skewed or skewed to the left. There's some value here on the left that's pulling the mean in the negative direction. And then if the mean and the median are pretty much equal, we call this symmetrical, meaning that the bottom half of the data and the top half of the data are pulling equally so that the mean and the median are pretty much at the exact same. We call this symmetrical. Here's our first example, and I've worded these questions exactly like your homework tonight. The following table shows the marks out of 35 on Friday's trigonometry test for a certain grade 11 class. It may or may not be my class, I'm not going to lie. So, represent these marks in a box and whisker diagram. Okay, let's go through the box and whisker just to make absolutely sure that you know what you're doing. Right. Remember that first, in the box and whisker diagram, I need my max, my min, and my three quartiles. So, to work out the three quartiles, I need to put the values in ascending order. Then I need to count inwards. There's not too many values here, so I can literally just cover up the numbers from the outside working in until I get my middle values. I get my median or my quartile 2 as 18.5. It has to be the average between those two middle numbers. And then again, quartile 1 is the median of just this first half of the data. So from 3 to this 18, I start counting inwards, and I get that quartile 1 is between 15 and 16. Sorry, between 15 and 17, or 16. The third quartile, do the same thing to the top half of the data from 19 to 32, and counting inwards, I land up between 21 and 22, which is 21.5. Okay, my box and whisker plot, remember that you need to draw a proper number line labeled with regular intervals. I've chosen an interval of five here, but you could have chosen twos or even ones if you want to get down to that level of accuracy. Then you need to draw the box and whisker and label each value. The reason for this is that if, you're, if your number line doesn't show all the values, then it's not going to be easy to read what this value is unless you label it. Same thing with 16. 16 is not written on my number line, so I need to label it so that I know exactly what that value is. Okay, so this box and whisker shows my four quartiles. Right. First problem is done. We'll use our box and whisker plot to comment on the distribution of the data in number two and to answer number three. In number two, where it says comment, what they want to find out is, is it negatively skewed, positively skewed, or is it symmetrical? To work that out, remember that I need the median and the mean. Okay, especially because this box and whisker is not super obvious to see the way it's skewed. Sometimes they are. Let's work out what the mean is. So we have our formula for the mean. We know that it's the sum of all the values divided by the number of values. In this case, I had 20 students still waiting on a few tests from a few bed dogs, but nonetheless, we carry on. Okay. So we add up all the scores and we end up with 366 divided by those 20 students gives me a mean of 18.3. Now, do I have to show all this working? Yes, you need to show all this working even though your calculator can do mean for you. We talked about how to do that in the last lesson. You still need to show the sum over n. So you need to show this 366 over 20 and the final answer. Okay, there is a shortcut, and I'm not positive that all the calculators can do this, but the silver one that I have can do it. 
to get the sum here, press you enter your values like I showed you how to do last time. Press Shift 1, select 3 for sum, and then you're going to select 2 for sum of x. This is how it is on my calculator. Some calculators might be slightly different, so check and see on yours. It can save you some time. Right. Going back to our box and whisker, let's plot this mean value on our box and whisker. So on the box and whisker, 18.3 is pretty much in line with my median, 18.5. So we said that when the mean and the median are about equal, I'm going to call it equal because it's really, really close. All right. So we have a symmetrical distribution here. Okay. Number three says, which one of the mean or median is the best measure? Well, because they're pretty much equal, both of these are going to be good measures. Okay, so you could advocate that both the mean or the median are equally good uh, indicators of this data. They, they equally represent the data quite well. Our last example today focuses on the speed at which motorists traveled past a school on a specific morning. This is not our school, this comes out of the textbook. Um, but some of you might relate to it if you've ever uh, feared for your life when, you, when you're entering the school gate. Um, right, so draw a box and whisker diagram. We now should feel quite confident in doing that. So let's skip ahead. Our box and whisker diagram is going to end up looking like this. In this example, they've chosen intervals of two. So the number line is going up by twos. But because we're going all the way from 18 to 82, you might even choose to go up by fives or tens or whatever. That choice is up to you as long as you do it consistently with your ruler spaced out properly. Okay. Um, so comment on the distribution of the data. Now, this one is a little bit easier to see. Okay, so we can actually comment on whether it's negatively or positively skewed just by looking at the box and whisker. Right. The majority of the data, remember that the box represents the middle 50% of the data. So that means that from here all the way to the top is 75% of the data. So the majority of the data lies above 49, and there's a small portion that lies in this segment. Okay. What that means is that there's some value down here that's pulling down the rest of the values. So this is an example where our mean is going to be pulled down by these few values at the bottom. And we call this negatively skewed. Okay, so we can, without determining the mean, in this example, because the box and whisker is quite obviously shifted, we can we can go ahead and answer that it's negatively skewed. Then it says, without calculating state whether the mean is more, less, or equal to 64, well, we know that because it's negatively skewed, this 18 is pulling down the mean, so the mean is going to be somewhere less than 64. So the mean is going to be less than 64. But let's just work out the mean because we can do it in our calculator quickly, and we have some shortcuts to do that. Let's just do that quickly. So the mean, I take the sum, which I just showed you how to do in the calculator, divide by the number of values, and I get a mean of 60.2 kilometers per hour. Okay, so I can see now that this is definitely negatively skewed because the mean is lower than the median. Okay, the last one says, which measure of central tendency best represents the speed at which the motorists traveled? The measures of central tendency, mean, median, and mode. You're almost never going to use mode unless, like, let's say you have 100 values and all of them except one are the same. Then the mode would be a really good representative. But otherwise, you're going to look at either mean or median. Okay. Now, let's say that you were using the mean. Does this mean really represent the data very well? If you let's let's put it another way, if the headmaster says the average speed of people going past our school is 60.2, then 
that's not really accurate because actually most of the motorists are going faster than that. So if you reported this, if the headmaster reported this, this would actually be sort of dangerous because people would think, oh, motorists aren't really going as fast. Okay, so the median in this case is a better indicator of the data because it really does reflect the majority of the data better and it's not as affected by this outlier at the bottom, right? So anytime that your data is skewed, or I shouldn't say anytime, most times the data is skewed, the median is going to be a better indicator of the data. If you want to look more at this or you're confused about how to do the box and whisker, this came from page 314 in your textbook and they show very nicely how to work out the quartiles. So you can look there. For homework, you're going to do page 317 to 320, A, C, D, and H. And then if you want extra practice with this, do B and I. In a couple of lessons, we're going to actually come back to this idea of skewness, but we're going to look at it in terms of grouped data and histograms. So we're going to see that there's a relationship between the box and whiskers we just talked about and what it looks like on a histogram. Little preview there. All right. Talk to you next time.